Thank you very much. So my talk will be focused on how to decode basic an, an IBD OR node uh, when we perform a structural plastics and a small other sections. And obviously this talk is mostly focused on uh, uh, the majority of the audience uh, who are IBD uh, doctors, correct? So I have no conflict of interest. In the area of, of uh, perfect coding, what I will try to do and show is how to decode an OR node and what should we be looking for and what should we um, request the, doc the surgeon to tell us when they dictate operative nodes, which will influence how good we can take care of patients. And this is one of the models that we have in our institution. And believe it or not, this is a pre-established OR node from the Corrector Surgery Service. In the era of, ele of electronic medical records, we are pushed to code or to uh, process our information efficiently. But a, a lot of that information is useless. And as you can see here, for example, one of the parameters is you know, we need to click is what is the weight bearing of a patient after a colorectal surgery uh, was performed. Uh, it's uh, pretty much useless. So we need to understand that we need to focus on what we need to dictate and what you guys should request to, our, to uh, the surgeons. In terms of estrutoplasties, in order to decode our nodes, we need to understand the indications for the surgery, the techniques that I use, which approach is minimally basic or open, what are the types of extrusion plastics that we usually perform? How many do we do? What is the location of those structures in the GI tract? If we do more than one extrusion plasty, how much distance do we leave in between the bowel, correct? And a bit of historical per perspective, this has been done for many years. In the late 80, 1800s, uh, Henny Chemicolics performed pyloplasty, and since then, uh, we've uh, uh, seen a very nice evolution of this technique for IBD patients. So f the first thing is the indication. When should we consider situ plastics? And we should consider when there's diffuse involvement of the small bowel with multiple strictures. We should consider them when there are strictures in a patient who has undergone major or previous major abnormal uh, resection. On patients who have a rapid recurrence of Crohn's disease, patients who have strictures in a short bowel syndrome, and when you have fibrotic strictures which are non phlegmonous And at the same time, when should we do not consider those estrusioplasties? And that uh, should be on patients who have free or contained perforation of the small bowel, patients who have phlegmonous inflammation with penetrating disease, when we see multiple strictures in a short segment of bowel, when we see strictures which are in close proximity to an area which is chosen for resection, and when there's associated uh, hypovolemia of the patient. So the types of uh, estrusioplasties, the most common is the, the ones I'm gonna uh, discuss here, are basically defined and based upon the length of the stricture itself. So that's what, that will define which kind of technique we perform. And I'm sorry, the first one is the Henny Chemicolics, which is done for short strictures. Basically, you open the bowel in a longitudinal fashion and close in a transverse fashion. When you have medium length strictures, we perform a fine estrictoplasty, which is essentially a folded Henny Chemicolics. And for long segment, segment strictures, we uh, prefer the Michelassi. This is not too commonly performed anymore. And um, the, one of the issues is we, if you have an astomotic failure that leads to a, a highly uh, significant loss of small bowel. So, estrusioplasties have been studied for many years. A lot has been done from the Clinical uh, Clinic Foundation, uh, from Dr. Fascio, and where they looked at how safe a estrusioplasty is in the management of Crohn's disease. And, and I know it's, it's, it's late and I don't want to give you too many numbers, but the reality is that uh, it's been proven that there's no difference in recurrence rates uh, and, there's, and when there is microscopic positive margins, did this not increase the risk of recurrence? There are other, many other papers which have looked at the long-term results, and the conclusion in summary is that estrutoplastis is a safe and effective procedure for Crohn's disease in appropriate patients, correct? So there's some questions that we open where, or we perform when we do perform estrutoplastis, and when we see multiple strictures, what parameters we use whether to perform one technique over the other? And I have the, uh, the pleasure to work with one of our chief residents who came from University of Chicago and did a lot of work with Dr. Hurst, uh, who, who is a PhD on geometrics and flow models, and he gave me a bit of input. And 
just briefly to summarize, I think this is a great, a great uh, slide which shows that the whole point of doing a stichoplasty is to increase the cross-sectional area of the small bowel, correct? And we do achieve that, as you can see in the right graph, in the green aspect of the right graph, there's an increase in the cross-sectional area. But the wings of the plasties, we actually see a decrease in the cross-sectional areas. That's important when GI doctors or when other kinds of health providers do perform surveillance, either endoscopic or radiologic, and they tell us, hey, there, there's an early recurrence, so there's a structure of the stichoplasty. Sometimes that decrease in cross-sectional area is actually expected due to the geometric differences that we, we, we perform. And that event is not seen in another technique, such as the Michelassi isoperistaltic technique. Even more important is that how many stichoplasties we perform is important for you guys to know, correct? And how close in between each of them we can perform them. And what we've seen, and this are in models, not in, in human models, is that when we perform estrusioplasties which are too close together, the bubble in between those estrusioplasties, the cross-sectional area collapses to zero, almost to zero. So that's also important to understand when we're doing surveillance of those patients. Uh, what other things should we look for and what other things we should ask the surgeon to note and to do document is, was the small bowel run? Did we inspect the entire length of the small bowel from the ligament of traits to the terminal ileum? And if we did, how did we do that? Did we inspect only? Did we palpate? Did we do special things such as the bullet techniques or placing certain tubes in the lumen of the small, of the small bowel to assess mouth structures? When we perform estrusioplasties, do we mark them consistently? I do mark them consistently f with some clips. So when you guys are following the patients, or even we are following the patients, we understand where these were and if there's recurrence of these structures. Is there a correlation with the imaging that we did perform before surgery with the intraoperative findings? And that's also something we should document in the OR notes. And is there any other significant findings that we can see? In terms of small bowel resection, again, it's important to understand the patient and the disease and the indication for surgery, and that will help you decode the OR notes. The indications for small bowel resections basically are those contraindications of estrusioplasties, to, to make it simple, but when we have free or contained perforation, when we have phlegmonous inflammation with penetrating disease, when we have multiple structures within a short segment of bowel, when we have structures which are seen in proximity to an area which we have chosen for resection, and when we have hypovolemia. There are many different techniques. The most too common, as you probably know, are end-to-end -end and side-to-side. -side. Obviously, uh, there's a bit of controversy which is better than others, uh, a lot of different data, some of which is coming from our institution. But uh, each of them has uh, its adequate uh, patient selection and uh, indication. A couple of meta-analyses have shown that there's higher leak rates on uh, hands-on end-to-end. That's probably due to the fact that surgeons are not trained anymore on, on, on doing hands-on astomosis. The truth of the matter is that the only randomized study that was uh, done did not show any evidence of, of difference in leak. And what about evidence of anastomotic recurrence? The only, on, on, only randomized controlled trial uh, with a mean follow-up of 12 months, didn't show any evidence or difference, statistical difference, I will say, when they looked at endoscopic versus symptomatic recurrence. So which keywords we should look for in the OR notes? Again, which uh, um, approach was done? What is the anastomotic technique? I sometimes read uh, notes from surgeons, um, very good surgeons, and you cannot tell which, which anastomosis they performed. What are the other key factors in surgery? For example, we sometimes don't mention there's a significant spillage for whatever reason. But if you look at the wound classification that we need to provide before and after surgery, any kind of bowel surgery, it's a clean contaminated surgery, unless you have significant spillage or significant or, uh, or unexpected findings, correct? So you see wound classification, clean contaminated before and dirty or contaminated after, you know that there's been a, a significant uh, unexpected finding in the OR. What is the estimated blood loss as well as the operative time? The higher these parameters are, usually the more involved the surgery is, and probably the more difficult the patient will have to recover from the surgery itself. How much, or what was the extent of the resection? 
And again, did we inspect the small bowel to the ligament, uh, the entire uh, small bowel? And I think this is, I'm a bit reiterative on this, but it's in, extremely important to perform this maneuver. And when patients undergo multiple resections, do we measure the length of the small bowel? And if we do, do we document that in the OR note or we communicate that with our colleagues? I think it's extremely important that we should perform also that, that, uh, that note. Again, any unexpected findings that we can see in the OR? The severity of the disease, was the extent of the disease different to what we thought preoperatively? And were there any other uh, significant uh, parameters such as different phenotypes that, that uh, we've encountered in the operation? When we create stomas, and, and, and pretty much to wrap this, this, uh, this talk, it's extremely important to note which stoma we created. This can create a lot of confusions. Not all stomas are the same. And end ileostomies are different than loop ileostomies, and certainly different than end loop ileostomies, which can cause a lot of confusion because microscopically from the outside, an end loop ileostomy certainly looks like a loop ileostomy. Physiologically, obviously it's not. So in, to conclude and to summarize, the best way of decoding an OR node is knowledge of the patient, knowledge of the physiopathogenesis of the disease, understand the basic uh, principles and surgical techniques that we have in our armamentarium, look for certain keywords that can guide you, scrub in, ask the, the, the surgeon, can I scrub in, can I come into the OR? I have, I have a lot of uh, colleagues which have done that in, in my institution. And probably the most important part of this is, and it has been reiterated in the prior days of this, of this uh, meeting, is communication, communication, and communication between the team is extremely important for us to uh, obtain adequate outcomes. And it's always a teamwork, it's not an individual teamwork. Thanks, thank you very much.